It's hard to remember now, but there once was a time where the only way to consistently hear new and popular music was by listening to the radio. Spotify wasn't founded until 2006 and smartphones weren't a thing anyways. iPods were new and were gaining some popularity, but if you couldn't figure out how to get that to play in your car and if you weren't in a large city, your options for what you were able to actually listen to were incredibly limited. I remember there were three stations worth listening to where I was growing up. The pop station, the rock station, and the country station. This was the late 90s and early 2000s. And when a song was popular, it tended to be huge. And for a long time. There were times where it felt almost impossible to get away from certain songs. One such song is the ever-iconic A Thousand Miles by Vanessa Carlton. This song has become one of the most recognizable songs of all time. Everyone knows this song, or at least the earworm that is this piano riff. This is a song that came out over 20 years ago, and still, covers of this song get tens of millions of views. You've seen, or I guess heard this song used in movies, TV shows, everywhere. You get it, the song was pretty big. But there were a few different things that really propelled its success into the stratosphere. First was the song's debut, which came in the popular and timeless movie Legally Blonde. This was the first time the song was heard in its finished version. And then there was this song's popular music video, which features Vanessa strapped to a piano as the scene behind her changes as she travels around a city. And a quick tangent here, but have you ever seen a more obviously green screened video? It looks like the really bad green screening that we've seen in The Office, like when Aaron is in Florida. Except, guess what? I just lied to you. The whole video was done practically. Vanessa Carlton was strapped to a piano that was attached to a truck and was actually driven around a city. This is all 100% real, down to the horses running behind her on the beach. And I don't fully get how they made the video look like it wasn't done naturally, but hey, good for them. But this song didn't get absolutely massive until the movie White Chicks came out. Terry Crews jamming his ever-loving heart out to a thousand miles is what really cemented it in the American zeitgeist for the rest of time. And for a song this popular, it might surprise you that no one's really sure who the song was actually written about. We've had other songs in the past in a similar category, where people don't really know who a song was written about. Some of these have been solved in the past, and some persist. This has become something of an internet mystery that I've seen pop up time and time again. It actually came back up while I was working on this video, because of course it did. And a bunch of websites wrote articles about the whole thing. But it's such an interesting question that I'm surprised more people haven't been asking this question for years. Just who is this song actually about? There, unfortunately, isn't a definitive answer. Vanessa Carlton is purposely vague when asked the question directly, but I feel confident in the list of people who have actually managed to narrow it down to, and I'll go over them all individually here in a bit. But before I actually get into that, let's start with the artist behind the song. Vanessa Carlton. She was born in 1980 in Pennsylvania. From the time she was young, she had a love of music. When she was 9, she got into ballet, and then when she was 14, she began school in New York at the School of American Ballet, which is considered one of the best ballet schools in the world. While she was here, she was self-admittedly not the best student and would routinely cut classes and play music. It's around this time that she would begin to write the song that would make her famous. I've seen some videos mention that she was a student at Juilliard when she wrote the song, but that is just factually incorrect. While the School of American Ballet and Juilliard are both in the Lincoln Center Plaza, it's not the same school in any way, shape, or form. In a Vice interview Vanessa did back in 2021, she gave us the biggest hints about who the song was actually about. First is that this person was a Juilliard student, and that in itself doesn't do a ton to narrow it down, even though Juilliard itself only has around 600 undergraduates at any point. But Vanessa then specifies that she doesn't want to reveal who it is because this person is now a famous actor. And yeah, that really narrows it down quite a bit. 
though I guess the term famous could be fairly subjective. If someone has a Wikipedia page, are they famous? What about if they have a Wikipedia page but no picture? Are they still famous but less so? Obviously yes, we can't all be Corbin Blue famous. And it is worth noting that Vanessa Carlton is bisexual, so when she's intentionally vague when using pronouns in this interview, that could be more intentional than meets the eye. Now, looking at lists of people who went to Juilliard around this time, there are a few possibilities that jump out to me who have all been mentioned a few different times in online discourse. These being Jessica Chastain, Anthony Mackie, Alan Tudyk, Wes Bentley, and Glenn Howerton. The first person we can effectively scratch off the list is Jessica Chastain. Because again, while we do know that Vanessa Carlton is bisexual, in a 2003 MTV interview, she stated directly, quote, he never knew and he never will. Actually, I don't even have a crush on him anymore. And this could be written off as, hey, this was 2003. People weren't generally as out and proud at the time. And I get that. It's definitely possible, but there's no way to say for sure, so for the time being, I'm crossing Jessica Chastain off the list. If written in 97, then that also means we can probably write off Anthony Mackie as well. For one very specific reason. In the Vice interview, Vanessa's mother mentions that the piano riff for the song was specifically written in the summer when she was 16 going on 17. But there was one fella who was certainly not falling in line. If she was born in August of 1980, that would have been the summer of 1997. Anthony Mackie graduated from Juilliard in 2001. Juilliard, like most colleges, is a four-year program. Working backwards, that means that while he would have been at the school in 1997, he would have likely started in the fall of 1997. Meaning that when she was already working on the song, that she would not have been able to meet or have even passively seen Anthony Mackie yet. Though, again, it is possible that she had the music for the song written before the lyrics. But because we have no way of proving that that was the case, Anthony Mackie is also being crossed off the list. And quickly, a video I mentioned earlier also brings Lee Pace into the equation, but I'm not even including him for the exact same reason. He graduated in 2001 and wouldn't have started until the fall of 97 as well. Now, working the other way, Alan Tudyk dropped out of Juilliard in 1996, meaning that if Vanessa Carlton had a crush on him, she would have held that crush for over a year after last seeing him and then writing a whole song about it. Which, again, is certainly possible, but makes me think that Tudyk is also worth crossing off the list. Next is Wes Bentley, yet another Juilliard dropout. But the difference here being that he dropped out in 97. We don't have a ton of details for obvious reasons as to when Wes Bentley exactly dropped out, or if he just stopped going to classes or whatever, but Bentley strikes me as a real possibility here. He's only a few years older than Vanessa. As with everyone else on the list, he's gorgeous. Maybe the most gorgeous. What are you doing? Yeah, his timeline actually matches up fairly well. I've read online that some people have claimed that they've seen her say at concerts that the song was about Wes Bentley, but as far as I've been able to find, there's really no evidence of this. And to be perfectly honest, it kind of seems like something she wouldn't actually do. The only possible detraction from this list is that Bentley only attended from 96 to 97. But I mean, crushes come on quick, so that's not really much. So Bentley remains on the list, alongside our only other really viable possibility, at least going off of how I'm viewing things. And that is Glenn Howerton of Always Sunny fame. This is the fan favorite possibility. Partially because it's kind of hilarious, but also because it kind of feels like it makes the most sense. And again, while there isn't any definitive evidence, we can talk about the implication. The timeline makes sense. Glenn was at Juilliard from 96 to 2000. He's incredibly handsome in the way that would make a lot of people kind of wary about approaching him. He's very famous, not just for his work on Always Sunny, but for many other shows as well. And this is kind of a weird rabbit hole to go down, but let's take a look at Vanessa Carlton's dating history. John Mayer, Stephen Jenkins of Third Eye Blind, and John McCauley, her husband. It's not crazy to look at all these guys and see that she kind of has a bit of a type, and Glenn seems like the most likely to fit within that type. 
While I was making this video, I actually reached out to Vanessa Carlton's management to see if I could get any kind of statement about this. Obviously, I never heard anything back and I don't really fault them for that. I'm just some weird handsome guy making videos on YouTube after all. So personally, I think that Glenn Howerton is the most likely candidate. He ticks all the boxes and neatly fits all the criteria that have been presented. And while this might not provide the most conclusive evidence that Glenn might actually know that he's the subject of the song, let's start with this picture of Vanessa Carlton. Now here's a picture of Maureen Ponderosa. You decide. <laughs> 